This episode of Positively Trek is brought to you by our supporters on Patreon, including Jim Stoffel, Joyce Marin, and Carl Morris. Visit patreon.com slash positively trek to help support the podcast. Perks include early access to episodes, exclusive content, shout outs, associate producer credits, and more. Thanks to all of you for your support. And now, let the show begin. Welcome, everyone, to another exciting episode of Positively Trek with your two Star Trek expert hosts, myself, Dan Gunther, and with me, as always, Bruce Gibson. Bruce, how are you doing today? Oh, I'm, I'm doing great. I wasn't expecting you to throw to me because you said two experts in Star Trek, and I thought, oh, I wanted to know who the other one was. Oh, yeah. No, you're, you're absolutely an expert. Like, yeah. You, how many years have you done a Star Trek book podcast and all the Star Trek podcasting, you are definitely an expert. I, okay, so maybe I am, but you're more of an expert than I am. Ah, eh, whatever, whatever. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> well, regardless, welcome to Positively Trek, where we are talking about the week's Star Trek news, as well as uh, just a general Star Trek discussion. Uh, so this week we have some, I'd say, product-heavy news. We have some stories of new products that are coming available in the next year or so, as well as an interesting story about a Gene Roddenberry biopic that is in the works. So excited to talk about those. And yes, I am the kind of person that did look up before he started recording today. Is it biopic or biopic? And it, it is definitely biopic. <laughs> Right, like bi biography, biopic, biopic. Yeah, yeah. biopic. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, I've always heard both, but I was like, I've got to look this up. So that's that's the kind of nerd I am. <laughs> well, I wouldn't have done that because I always thought it was biopic. I don't know if I've heard the other pronunciation. If I did, I it just went over my head. Yeah, I, I read. I read. An, starting to read an interesting article about grammar about why people tend to go towards saying biopic but then i was like oh no i've i've got a i've got an episode to record i'll i'll get back to that later yeah that's <laughs> interesting i would never yeah now that you say it looking at it if i never saw that word before or heard it i probably would read it as biopic yeah mm -hmm. that totally makes yeah. sense to me See, I'm not the only one who mis mispronounces words, so that's good to know. <laughs> I was watching, rewatching Star Wars The Bad Batch earlier this morning because I'm getting ready to do that on a different show. And they call the, the girl in there, they call her Omega. But then when she says her name, it's Amiga. Oh, with her <laughs> accent. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, in Star Wars, names are always pronounced differently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's great. I, I should rewatch The Bad Batch, too. I really enjoyed that. Yeah, it's good. I like Cad Bane. He's one of my favorites. Yeah, absolutely. But we aren't here to talk about Star Wars today. We should be talking about Star Trek. And there's a new action figure coming on the market from our friends over at X06. We've featured them a few times on the podcast before. Uh, they're the ones that do the 112th scale, really highly detailed quite pricey high-end action figures and they've unveiled their next project so they had data and picard and the borg queen revealed so far now they're going to be doing captain Catherine janeway uh, which will be coming out they're aiming for october release and interestingly enough this is the first captain janeway figure produced since the series was still airing in the 90s on UPN. So we got the Playmates figure back then, and then this one. So, I mean, we've had little statues and Hallmark ornaments and stuff, but this is the first action figure since then, which, uh, that's crazy to me. I don't even have any of the first action figure of her, so any of... Uh, so. Well, it makes sense that during the time Voyager was on, they would come out with action figures. But since yeah. Voyager has been off the air, I mean, it would make sense that maybe there'd still be some. But, you know, typically when a show's on air and after it leaves, they continue to making, you know, as many things as they used to. But now we're getting it. It's, you know, it's a long time coming, but here it is. Definitely. And especially if you think like how many Kirks and Picards have we gotten since then, right? But no love for Janeway from the action figure market until now again. So... 
So these will retail for one eighty nine ninety five US dollars plus shipping. Uh, so they're very very high end. They come with a number of accessories, including a tricorder, a phaser, a phaser rifle, a pad, and of course a cup of coffee because it's Janeway, right? You've got to have her trademark cup of coffee. And uh, this looks gorgeous. These, this sculpt looks amazing. It's from her kind of later seasons look with the shoulder length, short hair kind of thing. Beautiful, really beautiful figure. Yeah, I mean, she has all her weapons, including the cup of coffee, because that's her ultimate weapon. Mm-hmm. Uh, she defeated the Borg with it, as she said. Absolutely. So I find it interesting that it is coming out now. And like you said, having that later season's look, because the figure's out at the same time that Prodigy's coming out, which, oh, of course, that's thing, true, is part yeah. of Prodigy. So you would almost assume that maybe they're bringing this out because of Prodigy. And so, you know, we're resurrecting Janeway into the ether of Star Trek fandom and new shows. But it's a the Janeway in Prodigy has a different look. It's the earlier season look. Yeah, that's true. So I, I, I love that the timing of this. That's a good idea. I never thought of that. But of course, tent pulling it to the Pro- Prodigy release. That makes a lot of sense. So... Uh, Janeway will be kind of re-entering the cultural zeitgeist a bit. So maybe hoping to cash in on that a little bit. That's that's good marketing. Yeah, because when I'm looking here on this article, I'm looking at uh, Trek Core that you posted here for us, that it's coming out this winter. So this will be probably at the time of Prodigy or maybe after Prodigy has mm-hmm. aired. So there might be... Uh, some energy there. Yeah, I'm interested to see because the marketing, as I'm seeing on this article, is all t- connected to Star Trek Voyager. There's no mention of Prodigy. Yeah, for sure. Well, definitely we'll be looking for this. I love these photos. I, I would love to be involved with the photo shoot for these. That looks like they had some fun with some Borg green lighting and all that kind of stuff. Uh, looking forward to seeing these in the hands of collectors this winter for sure. Uh, so moving on from that, There's some other products that are coming which are interesting. So Factory Entertainment, they have the license to do some Star Trek items as well. And they're debuting an all-metal, budget-friendly series of scaled-down Star Trek prop replicas. So this is fascinating. There'll be like small-scale versions of weapons and stuff that we've seen in Star Trek. And the two that they're kind of showcasing for now are the Lerpa, which is the Vulcan weapon that Kirk and Spock used against each other in Amok Time in the original series, and uh, Klingon Batleth, probably the most iconic bladed weapon from Star Trek. And they'll be, uh, so the Lerpa will be about eight inches long and the Batleth about seven inches long. So uh, very small kind of scaled down display items but by the looks of it very faithful to the source material they look really cool right and they're on little stands that say star trek on them so you can display them very nicely as you said they're not real big and i thought it was something that we could play with with the janeway action figure right she could hold these they're probably just the right size for her (laughs) very very likely absolutely but uh yeah they're they're gorgeous replicas it looks like they've kind of gotten every detail down as well as they possibly can just in that smaller scale and they're metal too so they're very beautiful yeah i wonder if i can use them as like utensils in the kitchen for something (laughs) you know because they're metal and they're the right size handheld or whatever but yeah 34.99 price so that's not bad Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely within the realm of of possibility for a lot of fans, a little bit more budget friendly and that kind of thing. I think these would look really, really great on a shelf, uh, you know, in a Star Trek collection. I think these look beautiful. So, yeah, this might be something I might look into getting for sure. Yeah, I'm looking on their website, Factory Ent, E-N-T for entertainment, factoryent.com, and you can pre-order them right now. Mm hmm. Definitely. So, yeah, we'll have uh, links in the description, of course, to these stories and uh, links where you can purchase these as well. Well, one last little piece of Star Trek merchandise to talk about, and this one is another Star Trek Discovery Blu-ray set. Uh, So they're combining seasons one, two and three into a three season collection. 
So for those of you out there who have been holding off getting the physical media for Star Trek Discovery, this new collection might be the way you want to get the uh, all three seasons so far of Star Trek Discovery. Uh, this is set for release on November the 2nd. And uh, like I said, contains all three seasons and has this lovely cover art with a collection of characters from all three of Discovery's seasons. Uh, this looks beautiful. I, I won't be getting this myself. I have the Blu-ray collections from all three seasons, but I have to imagine there are a few people out there that would be looking to complete their collection if they haven't gotten Discovery already. Yeah, I do like the cover, uh, the artwork for this. Uh, there's a planet and maybe a moon with a bright light, like the sun behind it coming through. And then, like you said, all the different characters from Burnham to Pike to Laurel, Adira, Lorca. I mean, from all three seas. I mean, there's more and more of them. But this whole collection of characters there, it's kind of nice to reminisce and think, you know, wow, we've had three seasons and look at all the various characters we've seen that have not just come, but also have left the series over time too so i like looking at this yeah definitely it would look really good on on your shelf i think for sure uh so i i do have to say there are no new uh special features that are included with this i'm assuming just the special features that came with the original releases they're just repackaged in new packaging and packaged all together so uh you know completionists don't worry you don't have to get this if you already have all three seasons there's nothing extra here but uh, definitely a convenient way to get all three seasons if you don't have them already yeah so i'm looking on amazon right now and it's showing that the blu-ray set is 111 dollars 99 but it's five dollars cheaper if you go with the dvd at 106.99 now i don't know if these are final prices i'm assuming they are because you can pre-order but uh so yeah a little over a hundred dollars if you want all three seasons Mm -hmm. and the cool thing about ordering on amazon is if the price does change you get the lowest price that happens during your pre-order period which is i've always liked that about amazon so if the price goes up you're still paying whatever you locked in at, or if it goes down, you get that lower price as well. So that's pretty cool. Yes. Well, you know, if you consider how much you subs you pay to subscribe to a service that carries discovery, and if that's the only reason you're paying for that service is to watch discovery, that adds up to more than a hundred dollars fairly quickly. So finally, the final news story I want to talk about today is this Gene Roddenberry biopic that's in the works. So Deadline Hollywood uh, first reported this, and it was later confirmed by Variety, that a biopic about Gene Roddenberry, of course, the creator of Star Trek, is in development over at Roddenberry Entertainment. Uh, the script was written by Adam Mazur, uh, an Emmy winner best known for You Don't Know Jack on HBO, and uh, it's being produced by Gene's son, Rod Roddenberry, and Trevor Roth. So uh, this could be really interesting. I like the idea of this influential person getting a biopic made about them. You know, there's some really good biopics I've seen over the years, and I'd love to see one about the story of Gene Roddenberry. Yeah, maybe Rod Roddenberry plays his father, Gene, if he can act. <laughs> <laughs> you know, maybe we can audition, Dan. Maybe. I mean, I'm not an actor. I, 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 maybe you're an actor, but that's, that's definitely not something that I'm into. But yeah, this looks really interesting. And of course, uh, the Roddenberry Company has produced a number of documentaries and things over the years. So it'd be interesting to see them venture into this world of, of a more uh, narrative type story. Yeah, I, it would be interesting to see what they cover and maybe what they don't cover about gene's life you know i mean it's, there's a certain things that have been said about gene over the years and there's just some things i don't know if you know they're really true or things are exaggerated and such so the fact that his son is involved and i know that even as rod ronberry's son doesn't necessarily know everything but he's heard enough stories and talked to enough people and remembers things about his father that i think we'll probably get a fairly accurate you know, representation of Gene Roddenberry in this biopic. 
Yeah, definitely looking forward to this. No word on a release date or anything quite yet. This is still in early stages, but we'll definitely keep our ear to the ground for this project. Looking forward to see progress on it. And uh, yeah, Gene Roddenberry, of course, recently his 100th birthday, what would have been his 100th birthday passed. And uh, this is a good time to announce a project like this because, you know, he's been on the minds of a lot of Star Trek fans lately with lots of tributes kind of pouring out to, about him over the past few days. So uh, l- really looking forward to seeing what I'm assuming will be a celebration of the man's life. I would hope so. <laughs> I hope it's a celebration. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm sure it will be for sure. <laughs> Well, uh, what do you say we move on to our discussion topic, which uh, I think this is an interesting topic. And this came up recently on our Lower Decks episode. We were talking about the latest episode, Kayshawn, His Eyes Open. And that discussion kind of led to the topic of management styles in the Star Trek universe and how many lessons you can get uh, from the management styles of various Star Trek leaders over the years. So I thought it might be kind of fun to talk about the the leadership styles of some of Star Trek's biggest leaders, captains mostly, but well, I'm sure we'll touch on some other people as well. But uh, I don't I don't know. What do you think? Like, does Star Trek have a lot to offer in the realm of leadership? I think Star Trek, especially the captains, are a great example of effective leadership. I actually judge leaders even in my own job when I work for different people, I base them on what I've seen in Star Trek in a lot oh, of Oh, totally. You know? Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I was thinking about this earlier. A lot of the style of management from these captains are very similar to each other. They're not that vastly different, maybe except for Freeman being a micromanager. <laughs> but outside of that, <laughs> they have very similar styles, and they know they have to adjust depending on the situations. Absolutely. I I have one friend who really takes to heart the idea of what would Picard do when he's thinking about management styles and, and working in a, in a team and that kind of thing. He really takes that to heart and really uh, judges people on whether or not they're acting as he would see Captain Picard doing. <laughs> yeah, it, I mean, Picard is, a, when you were talking about that, I was just thinking about how Picard is has his own style and we really see the difference of styles when Jellico comes onto the bridge Mm -hmm. and temporarily takes over and Riker and some others are a little put off with the style of Jellico. And it's not like Jellico was wrong necessarily in his style. It's just, he had a different way of doing things. His style was just a little different. And sometimes that works for some workers and sometimes it doesn't, but even Picard's management style may not work for others. You know, sometimes he's a little, too serious you know Mm -hmm. and you know me like somebody like me reporting to a Jean-Luc Picard I mean I I work hard but I also play hard and I have humor and I don't know if that would work on his style I seem to do better working for someone who's a little more loose and a little more accepting of some humor and joking around and Picard loosens up as seasons go on some but that style for me is you know, as much as I appreciate him as a captain and one of my favorite captains, it's a style that I probably wouldn't fit really well with under that leadership. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. So Picard, I'd say, has a very like professional relationship with the people around him. He doesn't mingle a lot with them on a personal level. There's, of course, the famous scene at the end in All Good Things where he finally joins the poker game and says, I should have done this a long time ago, which kind of highlights the distance he's kept between him and his crew. And there's always that idea that Picard is forgiving of mistakes and maybe a little bit has a little bit more leeway than say a Jellico, but at the same time has that very polished very professional feeling on the bridge like there wouldn't be a lot of joking around on the bridge i don't think yeah it's like not that long ago i went to the office i haven't been in the office really in the last year and a half because of the pandemic but i did go in one day and the president of that division of the company was there and when he saw me you know he's just like well look you made an appearance today he he actually exists he's alive you know joking and (laughs) ha ha 
But Picard wouldn't be like that. He'd say, oh, I see you're made into the office today. You know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's just not my style. <laughs> yeah, I feel like you would thrive, just on what you're saying here, more under Riker's command, as we've seen a little bit recently on the Titan in Lower Decks, where... He is a little bit more jokey, like he obviously expects a lot from his officers, but he kind of pals around with them a little bit, makes little jokes, you know. And of course, a bit of that is kind of exaggerated by the kind of uh, cartoonish nature of Lower Decks, you know, exaggerating the humor a bit. But I still feel like, yeah, he would be a lot looser, a lot more willing to kind of pal around with his officers and kind of establish that relationship, which we also saw in TNG as well with how he deals with his subordinates a bit. Yeah. I I love how we now have determined that I work better in a cartoon environment than a real life. There you go. (laughs) (laughs) But you know, my favorite captain at this point even though it was really one season was Pike on discovery. I liked Mm -hmm. his style because it is very much a command style, but he can be loose. And like when he's asking the crew to introduce themselves, no rank, you know, it's very grounded to me. You know, it's very, uh, he's very much a humble captain where he feels like he's someone's in charge, but at the same time, he can give you a little wink. He can take a little joke. He can, put a little like humor in there but not to the point that's too far that it's a little everybody's a little too relaxed and too comfortable with the captain but i see that in other captains too i feel archer's kind of got that i think janeway definitely has that so i like that style yeah i love that you brought up pike and specifically that scene in particular where he says let's go around the room give me your names don't worry about the rank it doesn't matter and everyone lists off their names as it goes around the room But my favorite part of that scene is immediately after that, where he issues orders by name to each and every person on the bridge, showing that, like, this wasn't just some exercise to make people feel seen. He's actually seeing them and he's already learned their names and their jobs and that sort of thing. I love that. I love that, you know, he goes back around, says, you know, uh, Burnham, do this, so and so do that, Detmer, fly, good. You know, like he just has something to say to everyone and addresses them all by name and just shows that he's that kind of leader that really wants to get to know his team and stuff. And like this isn't a criticism of um, Picard or Cisco or, or anybody like that. But how many times do we see the bridge of the Enterprise D or ops where there's, you know, nondescript people working in the background and stuff and we never hear their name. We don't know their jobs. We have no idea what they're doing. Uh, you know, again, that's that's a television production decision. That's not like a comment on their leadership style or anything like that. But I love that in Discovery, we got that kind of like every single person. What is their job? What are they doing? OK, Pike is acknowledging them now. Yeah. And I'm glad you brought up Cisco, too, because I think Cisco's style is similar in a lot of ways to Picard's. I feel the same way about Cisco as I do Picard, uh, except, you know, maybe if Cisco's playing baseball. You know, so he does interact with the team a little more on a recreational side than Picard does. So I think Cisco is very much like Picard, but also can let his guard down and just enjoy himself with his crew when the time is right, when the circumstances feel right. But then he can switch Mm -hmm. on a dime when things call, he goes back into his leadership position. Yeah. With Cisco, the the scenes that stick out to me are his mentoring scenes with particular people, most especially Worf on a couple of occasions, because when Worf comes to Deep Space Nine, he's kind of being groomed for command, right? He switches to the command track, and it's obvious that, like, his career is trending in that direction. And I love those moments where Cisco takes Worf aside and is mentoring him, and there's a fourth season episode rules of engagement where Worf uh, supposedly with the defiant accidentally destroys a civilian transport and it all turns out to have not been true it was faked in an effort to discredit the federation and Worf but at the end of the episode Cisco takes Worf aside and um, talks to him he says we got lucky this time nobody actually died but what lessons are we taking from this? And Worf says something along the lines of, I was in too high an emotional state, too eager to engage in battle with the Klingons. I should not have taken the Defiant out in that condition. And 
Cisco says, that was your first mistake. What was your second? And Worf says, I didn't properly identify the target before engaging. And Cisco says, you're damned right you did. <laughs> you know, like he's got that harsh style, but it's, it's always in the service of making his officers better and never demeaning, but always pushing them to be the best they can be. And I think that's the case for a lot of our captains. Uh, Picard, again, there's a lot of similarities there, but Cisco, those scenes, I just, I love his leadership there. And when you were talking about that, it reminded me of Captain Giorgio, even though we don't see a lot yes. of her, but I see a lot of Cisco and Janeway in Giorgio as a captain. Mm-hmm. I always wanted to see more of the prime Giorgio because just that those couple episodes we get of her, I feel like there's a lot there, you know, they really packed a lot in. They say that they've all been together for seven years. I would have loved to have seen more of that because I feel a lot of that kind of command style with her too, where she's, yeah, pushing people to kind of be their best a little bit. You know, when um, Saru can't quite identify the target, can't quite get the sensors resolved, she needles him a little bit, but it's it's just prodding him a little bit to kind of get some more answers, right? I, I like that, where it's not demeaning, but she's pushing her officers, for sure. Yeah, and then, of course, we have Captain Lorca, who's from the Mirror Universe, and I don't mind his management style so much, even though he's from the Mirror Universe. I just mind his intent, and I think he brings a negative energy to the crew because he's from the Mirror Universe. But from a Mirror Universe standpoint, he seems like an effective leader. I like his management style in that case. Yeah. I'm, I had Lorca on this list and I'm glad you brought him up too, because I have some interesting things I think to say about Lorca because yeah, initially when we meet him, it feels like he's a strong leader and, and has, you know, strong leadership skills. But even before he's revealed as a mirror universe infiltrator, there's a couple clues that he's just like, not quite the regular Starfleet captain. And there's one part that I just like immediately bristled against him and and was like, I would not want this man leading me. And it's during a battle simulation where the tactical officer takes a little longer to like get a lock and in the simulation discovery is destroyed because the Klingon bird of prey takes them out. And Lorca, the, I think it's Landry at the time. She says, um, sorry, sir, I'll try and do better next time. And he says something like, it would be hard to do worse. And in that moment, the camera goes to Landry and she obviously is like mortified and crushed in front of the entire bridge crew. And I mean, there's motivation and there's trying to get the best out of your people, but that was public mockery designed to humiliate. And that is absolutely the kind of leadership that I just will immediately turn me against a manager or a superior. Like I just immediately lose respect for someone when they do that to someone else. And I understand in the heat of the moment things happen, but you know, without uh, an apology afterwards or something like that, that just, I do not react well to that. (laughs) Yeah. uh, Neither do I. And I've seen it not even just on me, but on many other people I've witnessed uh, having that type of manager. And it just, it doesn't work. And, you know, there's the saying that when people quit their job, they don't quit the job, they quit their manager. You know, it's the boss is the primary reason why most people leave a job. If they feel they have the support of the boss and they're not mocked by the boss, they'll tend to stick around. Yeah, definitely. And yeah, mockery is absolutely the the kicker. There's actually one scene with Cisco. I think it's in season two with Bashir. And a friend of mine who was watching Star Trek for the first time hated this scene with Cisco. And I, I like was trying to defend Cisco and stuff. But she had a point where um, Bashir interrupts Cisco's conversation with Ducat to ask a question about something to Ducat about um, Cardassian war orphans. And um, 
you know, Bashir or Dukat answers and, you know, then the conversation ends and stuff. Bashir turns to Cisco and says, I'm, I'm sorry for interrupting. I just had to, you know, know that blah, blah, blah. And Cisco says, don't apologize. It's been the highlight of my day. Don't do it again. <laughs> and uh, I was, you know, I was like, oh, that's kind of funny. But Bobby was like, I would be so mortified if I was Bashir. And like, that was, I, I can't believe Cisco did that. And I was like, oh, and I had a hard time kind of defending Cisco in that moment. I was like, yeah, that is kind of mean, I guess. They they did kind of kick Bashir around a little bit in the first couple of seasons when he's being all brash and childish and stuff. So, but that definitely changes later. <laughs> It does. And, you know, as I'm thinking about the different styles and, and what you were just saying, I've worked for so many different styles of managers, as probably many of us have. And have you ever had situations where, because of different styles, you've had conflicting messages from bosses? Because Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I would have a boss that say, you know, never do this. Don't do this when we go into a meeting. Just do that. You know, OK, OK, OK. And then I get another boss is like, well, why aren't you doing this? You need to. I'm like, because the last boss told me never to do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now I've got boss tell me to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that's really frustrating when that kind of thing manifests itself for sure. Uh, you know, I don't know that we've seen that so much in Star Trek. That would be interesting to see like a situation where a captain has this expectation, but it gets delegated, of course, to the first officer and the first officer has a different way of trying to get the crew to carry out that task or something. That would be an interesting kind of dynamic to see. I don't know if we've seen something like that, but that could really work in Star Trek. Yeah, the only one I can think again is going back to Jellico and kind of is some somewhat like that. But right. But, but yeah, over my career, it's been to a point where it's just like, I, you know, I have to adapt to whoever is my boss and their command style and just adapt to that situation and hope that over all these years that I make the right decision of which I should do and what I shouldn't do. But I'm always in the back of my head hearing different bosses saying, do this. No, don't do that. And I'm like, I don't know what to do. <laughs> the one, uh, one captain we haven't really talked a lot about yet, I'd say, is Janeway. And I think they had a really unique situation where her management style, her captain style had to adapt to the situation they're in, which is, of course, stranded on the far side of the galaxy away from the Federation and that kind of thing. And I feel like her command style at times had a lot more kind of uh, personal involvement with the crew than other captains. Because I feel like she had to be the captain to everyone and at the same time also a bit of a counselor at times because of the trauma of being away from home and all of this stuff as well. So I think there's some unique stuff to explore in Janeway's command style a little bit. Yeah, she actually mentions that she's going to have to change her style because of their situation of being trapped in the Delta Quadrant, and it could take 70 years to get back. So you're going to have to approach this differently. It's no longer just you're the captain of the ship and you're doing this with this crew for a short period of time. They may be creating a whole new society together if it takes them 70 years, and we're going to see generation of generation of officers or a community on the ship. So she's a community leader in addition to being a captain. So it's a, yeah, very different situation. She has to walk that line of being a captain, but also, like you said, like kind of being a counselor, kind of being that community leader of the ship and giving the crew hope. You know, a lot of times the captain has to do that based on the situation at the moment, like they're in a battle or whatever it is they're doing on a certain mission, they want to give their crew hope. But Janeway always has to give her crew hope that they will survive and that they will get home. It's the constant battle of trying to convey that message of hope. Mm -hmm. And not to mention the fact that part of the crew is not Starfleet as well. She's got the Maquis coming in. So, you know, maybe not loosening her command style she still is pretty strict with regards to starfleet protocol and that sort of thing but also kind of bringing those people in and bringing them up to speed and giving 
certain people the opportunities that maybe they wouldn't normally have had. So, for example, uh, it takes her a little while to come around to it, but promoting Balana, a Maquis officer, into the chief engineer position and showing that confidence in someone who, you know, maybe isn't necessarily as qualified on paper as somebody from the Starfleet crew, but taking the recommendations of Chakotay and seeing her in action, convincing her to promote her to that position based on merit and, and how she performs. I think that's a really good indication of the kind of adaptations she's had to make in that situation as well. And then of course, seven of nine, same situation Mm -hmm. and the doctor, you know, absolutely. Yeah. Discover his humanity side of things. And then, you know, in a sense with Neelix and Kess. So yeah, she's had a lot on her plate. Mm -hmm, Definitely. One other thing that I wanted to talk about, just kind of an idea that popped into my head as far as leadership goes, is the idea of needing to project confidence even when you're not 100% sure of what's going on. And I'm curious about your opinion about this and where this comes in in Star Trek. There's a really great scene in the season seven TNG episode Attached where Picard and Crusher are linked by these uh, little devices and they can kind of hear each other's thoughts and they're prisoners on this planet and they manage to escape. And they're kind of trying to make their way using the tricorder, following clues to try and get out of this territory. And Crusher's looking at the tricorder and she's like, I can't make out. It kind of dissipates here. I'm not sure which way to go. And Picard takes the tricorder, looks at it, looks up and says, it's this direction and starts walking. And Crusher's like, wait, you don't really know, do you? (laughs) And Picard's kind of embarrassed. He says, well, sometimes as captain, you need to project a a confidence that you may not necessarily have. And I thought that was interesting. What do you think of that and that quality in a leader? I think it's important because you do want your crew to trust you. So as someone who's leading, you have to show the authority and you keep and show that you can make decisions. You can't be wishy-washy. And in Picard's situation, he doesn't have the answer. No one has the answer. And so you have to pick either going left or right. And, you know, you can't just sit there going, well, I don't know. I mean, what do you guys think? Should we go left or right? Well, left or right. Uh, you know, you just have to make the decision and show them like, you know, we just need to move forward, build the confidence in them, in your abilities, and just say, we're going right. You can even say we're going right because we don't know the answer either way. We're just going to go this direction and see how it goes. And everybody's just going to go, okay, let's go. As long as someone makes a decision. (laughs) I mean, how many times are you in a situation where you have maybe with a group of friends and you spend like a half hour debating, trying to figure out what movie you guys are all going to go see? You know, yep. and it's like, so somebody just make a decision. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes that's all that's needed is someone to step up and make that decision. Like uh, one of my favorite things is um, when you uh, flip a coin because you have two decisions, you have two choices. So you flip a coin and you don't even necessarily go with the one that wins Because the coin flip makes you realize which one you really wanted. (laughs) So in some situations, someone making a decision will spark the group to kind of realize what direction they need to go in, even if it's not necessarily that exact direction that was picked. You have to start somewhere and, and get on the trail before you can kind of like, oh, wait, okay, no, this is right. This is what we need to be doing right now. It can kind of focus everyone in a way that like standing around complete inaction can't. So I'm just curious, as we're talking through these, what would you say your style of management is? Oh, that's a good question. I feel like I'm in a job interview suddenly. (laughs) (laughs) Um. My style, I really like to surround myself with people who know a lot about what it is we're working on. And and you and I have talked a bit about this before. There's some managers that want to be the smartest person in the room, right? And they'll want to make all the decisions themselves and make sure that everyone is kind of has to follow them. I personally think it works a lot better when you surround yourself with experts who may be a lot smarter than you in certain areas and that sort of thing, so that you can take those suggestions and then make the best decision for the group going forward. So in a lot of ways, 
Picard's model of asking for suggestions from his senior staff, I think that's huge to me. I think of the episode Cause and Effect, right, where the Bozeman is on a collision course with the Enterprise and Picard in that moment doesn't know exactly what to do. So he says suggestions and Riker says, decompress the main shuttle bay. The explosive reaction may push us out of the way. Data says, I suggest we use the tractor beam to alter the other ship's trajectory. And Picard makes the decision in that moment which course of action they'll take. Uh, Now, that one turns out to be the wrong one. They blow up several times, but eventually they get it right. Uh, But yeah, like I, I love that idea of, you know, the people around you aren't just mindless automatons who are there to fill seats. They have jobs and the best way to lead is to let your people do the jobs that they're good at. I agree. I, I totally agree. I, I, my style and I've managed many different people in many different companies and from small departments to larger departments. The thing is, is yes, I would like the best candidate, the person with the most experience or not even just the most experience, but the, the person who seems like the most expert. But that isn't always the case. I've had situations where I think this is the best candidate and everybody else agrees with me, but says, don't hire this person because they're so good, they probably won't stay long. They'll probably have Hmm. other opportunities. They want the longevity. I want the expertise. I'll take the expertise for a year. Yeah. As opposed to having somebody who's maybe not as good for and keep them for three years, you know, but You also inherit people. Sometimes you end up leading a department of people that you didn't make the decision for them to be there. And maybe they're not the best. Maybe they're not the experts. So I always take the stance of trying to get to know them a little personally, but also to know what is it that they're interested in? What do they think they're strong at? What do I think they're strong at? And focus on the abilities that make them great. And the weaknesses are fine. Because then we just have to shift the weaknesses to those people in the department who have the strength in that area. So you try to build on everybody's strength and have this complete unit as a team. And so my style is doing that, is trying to recognize what everybody's interested in and what they exceed in and focus on those attributes first. And then I also try to keep it a little light and approachable and us to also have fun. So again, work hard, play hard. And... I mean, maybe some people who work for me didn't like that style. I don't know. But I feel like most of them did because most people that have worked for me after all these years are still friends of mine. <laughs> so I guess they did sign. something right. But I, <laughs> I do attribute a lot of those things to Star Trek. I see that in Star Trek. I've seen that in Kirk and Picard and go down the road over the years of that style of just you know focusing in on what makes that person strong and using that person's strongest attributes and those that person's abilities for the job yeah that's a really good point and someone we haven't focused on but kind of popped into my head while you were talking there is saru in season three of star trek discovery and also by extension uh the admiral admiral vance and his relations with saru as well and that kind of leadership where you know you're mentoring the leader of a group of people as well. So that, that kind of one level higher and Saru is somebody who is, you know, maybe a little unsure of his abilities and that kind of thing, but made the attempts to connect with the crew. Remember the dinner that he hosted where it kind of came out that some of the crew weren't coping very well and that sort of thing. And, uh, and then the Admiral kind of mentoring Saru saying like, you know, this decision to leave this crew member, Uh, while, you know, we have bigger responsibilities, that's maybe not the best decision. You know, if you leave a crew member behind, the rest of your crew will never trust you again. You need to rescue Giorgio and and help her and and do this stuff. I love those lessons and just that little bit of like how to, how to lead a leader, I think is something that we don't see a lot of start, a lot of in Star Trek until that season three of Discovery. Saru has really grown, and I think Saru makes an effective captain now, but early Saru, not so much, because his gaglia and his, you know, lack of confidence and, you know, being scared, that that can make a crew nervous, right? Mm -hmm. And I think early days... I, I think that could be a weakness, you know, in, a, in infecting his crew, that he's he's showing maybe some indecision or some worry too much. And 
but since he's evolved and gotten better, he's got more confident, stronger. He make he's like, per, he's great now. Like I think he makes a great captain now. But early on, when he was trying to get into that role, and not so much. Yeah, I did like. I do have to say, even before he lost the ganglia, I loved his self reflection, and I think that's something very important for leaders as well. So in the first season, when he was in command while Lorca was captured by the Klingons, and he asked the computer to rate his uh, performance by comparing him to the top most uh, decorated captains in Starfleet, and you know set up those criteria for himself. Like, yeah, he wasn't that he he lacked a bit of confidence and was a little bit nervous. But at the same time, he recognized that in himself and sought to improve that. And by the end of the episode, he's made decisions and stepped up and realized he didn't need the computer's validation. He knows what he did. And he, you know, but he's still very self-reflective and kind of evaluating himself based on those criteria, I thought was an interesting move for a leader to make. Yes, absolutely. And as we're talking through these, other things just keep popping in my head. And I'm thinking back to not just uh, Saru, where it kind of it feels like the discovery is more of a family, of course, when it was under Lorca's leadership, right? They became more of a family union. And then, of course, with Janeway, we talked about the Voyager crew has to feel more like a family because of their situation. But then how many times do we hear about Star Trek? And even in TOS where Kirk's crew, you know, oh, but they're, they're more like a family, you know, they're, they're all there for each other. But in a lot of ways, Kirk has favorites. You know, when we talk about his family, we're talking about Kirk, Spock, McCoy, Ahura, Sulu, Chekhov, Scott, you know, we're talking about that smaller unit. I don't get that sense that Kirk really has any relationship with any other crew members and not that he needs to have a relationship, but I feel that he probably has very much of a distance from everybody else that he has his core group and everybody else probably looks at Kirk as unapproachable. Yeah, I could see that for sure. There's, there's definitely a bit of a, a, a standoffishness between him and other crew members yeah, like there's, I, I can't think of any real personal moments between him and a lot of the other crew, right? Right. One thing, just you mentioning Kirk, there's one moment of Kirk's command that I want to bring up that I think is a really great example of good leadership. And that's in the TOS episode Balance of Terror, when there's the... um revelation that the Romulans look like Vulcans and we have Styles on the bridge who keeps making these comments about Spock on the bridge in full view of everyone and Kirk finally pulls him aside and says leave any bigotry in their quarter in your quarters there's no room for it on the bridge do I make myself clear and in that moment making it known that that sort of behavior is unacceptable. Whereas, you know, I've seen a lot of leaders and uh, teachers, for example, who will let things slide in the classroom that will then kind of foster the idea that that sort of thing is acceptable in this environment and making that space feel very unsafe for other people who are the victims of those ideas or those words or those actions. And Kirk in that moment making it very clear that that is not acceptable on the bridge and I won't tolerate it. You know, I I love that moment. And I think in that instance, in that sort of situation, doing that very publicly so that everyone knows what the expectations are, I think is a really good, strong leadership move. That's an excellent point. That's one of the best command and management scenes in Star Trek right there. And, Mm -hmm. And he's not doing this, to the whole bridge he's pulling this one officer aside and being stern with him he's not trying to embarrass him or anything he's just setting up the rules and like you said do it early on don't let this keep going on because others will pick up on it and do the same and now it's you're trying to revert back and put the genie back in the bottle in a sense so it's good to address that right then and there so yeah i really love that scene yeah definitely one of my favorites for sure 
Well, is there anything that, uh, I, I know there's tons of stuff from all of Star Trek that we haven't mentioned, and I'm looking forward to hearing from some of the listeners for some of their favorite moments and stuff that inspired them management and command wise. But is there anything that, uh, you feel that we should bring up that we haven't yet? The only thing I want to bring up is I'm talking from my personal experiences and so are you, and you relate a lot of your personal experiences to jobs and to teaching, you know, having been in education. I relate mine to the different types of jobs, corporate type jobs that I have, but neither one of us have served in the military. And so I'd mm-hmm. love to know what the opinions are of people who serve or had served in the military about their opinions of the management style of these captains. Cause their, th- their, their situation in the military is closer to what we see in Star Trek. That's a terrific point. Absolutely. And, and yeah, I'm, I'm wondering, I'm hoping people will reach out with that sort of experience because that is definitely a world that I don't have any experience in. And uh, so, yeah, I, I'm really eager to hear what those kind of parallels are for sure. That's a really good point. Because I've seen things online where people will talk about something in Star Trek of like, oh, this should have happened, whatever, or they should have handled it this way. And then somebody will respond who's in the military. It was like, well, that would not work that way. You couldn't do it that way. It have, You would have to do it this way. In the military, the commander would have to do blah, 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 blah. So the military people have a little different perspective of how things should probably run Star Trek better than we do. Yeah, for sure. Well, if people in the military or otherwise want to reach out to us to share their thoughts on this topic or anything else we've ever discussed on Positively Trek, you can do that by emailing us, positivelytrek at gmail.com. We're also on Twitter, at Positively Trek. Reach out to us there. We'd love to hear from you. And of course, on Facebook, we have the Positively Trek page as well as the Positively Trek discussion group. I've noticed a lot of people liking the page lately. Make sure to also search out the discussion group and join that. There's always great conversations conversations happening there. We would love to hear from you on this topic and any others, of course. And Bruce, where can people find you when you're talking about your various management styles? <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, I can talk about all kinds of management styles, but if you're in the military, don't worry, I'm not really an admiral, but my Twitter is admiral underscore rex. That's Admiral with a under with the underline Rex. And then I'm also on the Star Wars Report podcast and have been doing occasional gigs on literary tracks and also have been doing the live show lately with Brandy Jackala. Cause Dan, you've been busy. I have been busy. I'm still on the road. And I'm sad to say the next couple episodes I'm not going to be here. Uh, I th- I'm I'm traveling up north to a fly-in only community uh there's a winter road but of course it's not winter right now so can't drive there and i will be leaving my computer at home sadly so i won't be uh on the next couple episodes of positively trek leaving it in the very capable hands of bruce gibson and uh he's gonna do an awesome job and uh i really look forward to coming back soon in september But uh, until then, you can reach out to me on Twitter. I'm at Kurtrats, that's K-E-R-T-R-A-T-S, youtube.com slash Kurtrats Productions. Again, that's going to be pretty quiet for the next uh, week and a half or so. And uh, yeah, Instagram, maybe I'll be taking some pictures of northern Saskatchewan and all that kind of stuff. And uh, thank you so much to our Patreon supporters for all of your help in bringing these shows to you. We really could not do it without you. Thank you so much. And until the next time I see you and until the next episode, stay positive. Stay positive.